Thank you for joining us today from wherever you are for a very exciting event on transportation equity. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Veronica Santos, the new Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Faculty Affairs at UCLA Samueli. I'm also a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering and director of the UCLA Biomechatronics Lab. Today's forum is one of the three-part engineering in action series we launched this year to address equity as it relates to engineering and science. Last month, we held a panel discussion on equity in artificial intelligence, and today, the topic is transportation equity. We will soon announce the third webinar to complete the series. These important discussions reflect our school's commitment to fostering inclusive conversations with experts in the respective fields. At UCLA, we believe diversity is an indispensable element of academic excellence. The UCLA Samueli School of Engineering is committed to providing a more equitable, diverse, inclusive, and nurturing learning environment. We strive to achieve a diverse student and faculty body with programs designed to complement a rigorous engineering education for anyone with the talent and the desire to succeed. To that end, we have put in place relevant programs and initiatives such as Awareness to Action, a two-part interactive multimedia workshop developed by our Women in Engineering program, or WE at UCLA. The workshop is offered as part of the school's curriculum and is designed to raise awareness of implicit bias and microaggression. Additionally, we'll be, we will be launching the Mentor Professor Program, recruiting faculty members who are not only excellent in their research, but also have demonstrated success in mentoring students from underrepresented and underserved populations and can provide mentorship in research and professional development. We are also working on a pipeline program for underserved middle and high schools so that students with an interest in studying STEM can have the necessary math skills to pursue higher education in engineering and other related fields. Now it's important to note that all of the work we do at UCLA Samueli is done in collaboration with many individuals and organizations in the community across the UCLA campus and beyond. To grow our programs and improve our climate, the approach must be inclusive and intentional. As you will find in today's panel, it's a partnership with key stakeholders, students, staff, faculty, alumni, and industry partners that encourages us to solve problems with different viewpoints in mind. It is only when we combine our strengths and perspectives that we have the ability to engineer the necessary change together. Before we start the program, I want to thank all of our cross-campus partners who brought you this event. A big shout out to the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA, the UCLA College, and in particular, the Division of Social Sciences, the Luskin School of Public Affairs, and the UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. I want to especially thank the students from the UCLA chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers for their hard work in launching this series. Thank you, Alexander Johnson, Daniel Ferguson, and Imani Elston for your dedication and leadership. Now it's my honor to introduce our distinguished panelists and moderator for this event. For those of you who connect Los Angeles's identity with its vast networks of freeways, Eric Avila, an urban cultural historian, spends most of his time deconstructing the myth of Los Angeles as a freeway utopia. Dr. Avila is a professor of Chicano Chicana Studies history and urban planning at UCLA. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in US history from UC Berkeley. In his books, Popular Culture in the Age of White Flight, Fear and Fantasy in Suburban Los Angeles, and The Folklore of the Freeway, Race and Revolt in the Modernist City, Dr. Avila explores how highway construction has impacted and fragmented the urban landscape of Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Avila. Our next panelist, Chris LeBon, is the Chief Sustainability Officer at LA Metro. And he will be appropriately calling in from a form of transportation for our transportation equity event. Thank you for coming. For nearly 18 years, Dr. LeBon has spearheaded more than 150 sustainability initiatives and is currently working to ensure that capital projects slated for the next 40 years will be sustainable and resilient. Many of these projects are to be completed in time for the 2028 Olympics, which will be held in Los Angeles. Dr. Lebon has been widely recognized for his work in developing sustainable transportation systems that are economically and socially beneficial to all levels of society. He received his bachelor's in geology from the University of the Philippines, his master's in civil and environmental engineering from Loyola Marymount University, and his PhD in environmental science and engineering from UCLA. 
Welcome, Dr. Laban. Our next panelist will soon be returning to her alma mater and joining our faculty next year in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering as an assistant professor. Dr. Reagan Patterson did her undergraduate study here at UCLA Samueli in chemical engineering. Currently, Dr. Patterson is a Transportation Equity Research Fellow with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation in DC, where she conducts intersectional transportation policy analysis and research. She earned her master's and PhD in environmental engineering at UC Berkeley, where her doctoral dissertation focused on the impact of transportation policies on air quality and environmental justice. Dr. Patterson, we're so excited to welcome you back. Thank you. It's so great to virtually return. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to welcome our moderator, Dr. Audrey Poole O'Neill, Director of Women in Engineering at UCLA, Adjunct Associate Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and co-creator of the Awareness to Action Program. Thank you for moderating today's discussion. Please take it away, Audrey. All right. Oh, thank you, Dean Santos. We're so glad uh, to have such a distinguished panel of speakers today. So let's jump right into our discussion. First off, um, what does transportation equity mean to you? Can each of you please share with us some of your personal experience and how it's informed your work, starting with Professor Avila. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to be here. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, quite simply, transportation equity to me means two things. Um, especially in a city like Los Angeles, it means equal access to all parts of the city from all parts of the city. And second, it also means equal responsibility um, for sharing the burden of infrastructural costs, either fiscal costs or environmental costs. Okay, great, uh, Dr. Patterson. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think my definition greatly agrees with Professor Avila, and then I would just add um, affordable, reliable, climate just and safe transportation options for all. Um, and as mentioned, having access um, to all goods and services, so jobs, education, healthcare, grocery stores, etc. Um, and so I would say, I would just add that um, to the response from Professor Avila. Great, Dr. Laban. Yeah, this shouldn't be that hard for me, right? Because I work for LA Metro. But uh, <laughs> but thank you again for for having me here today. I apologize. I had to call in from from my uh, vehicle here in the par safely parked in the parking lot. But uh, you know, in terms of equity, you know, uh, it's literally uh, as Professor Abel has said, you know, uh, access you know, allowing uh, our stakeholders uh, here in LA Metro to uh, get to where they need to be, especially those who are transit dependent. And then, you know, uh, the other part of it, uh, since, you know, uh, uh, I deal with the sustainability and resiliency and reliability of this system and, and making sure that it actually uh, becomes that, you know, allowing uh, for co-benefits, you know, across the board whatever it is, you know, whether it's, you know, the poorest neighborhoods here in Los Angeles uh, to the most affluent of neighborhoods here in Los Angeles that, you know, people have an opportunity uh, to actually use the system in the best way possible. So. Great, thank you so much. This question is for Professor Avila. How has the urban landscape we know today shaped by the expansion of freeways, particularly in Los Angeles? How has our urban landscape been shaped? That's a really good question. Um, thinking historically about LA over the past century, um, I think that there's a really uh, trite answer to that question by saying freeways enabled suburban sprawl um, in Los Angeles. Actually, that's, that's not really quite true. Um, uh, the, the old streetcar system, the red line, um, as it used to be known, um, is what enabled the first iteration of suburban sprawl. Uh, we don't really know it, but once upon a time, Los Angeles had the most expansive, the largest um, streetcar system in the world in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, and through land use policies and um, private ownership, um, 
the streetcars enabled that kind of sprawling character of Los Angeles that, that we know today and that, that the city has been stereotyped for. However, um, beginning in the post-World War II period, especially after 1956, that's when Congress uh, passed the Interstate Highway and Defense Act, the rapid construction of a highway uh, system um, really enabled suburban sprawl on an unprecedented level. So the sprawl that we're familiar with today um, is partly due to the old streetcar system and partly due to the freeways that were built um, in the post-World War II period. Um, the other impact I would say is that freeways also enabled the centralization of Los Angeles, particularly through the building up of downtown. Since roughly the 1950s, freeways served um, the downtown core and, and without freeways, we probably wouldn't have the kind of downtown that we know um, in today's Los Angeles. Great, thank you so much. And, and now we are gonna take a historical sort of look back. So historically, what activism has been effective in changing transportation laws? How have different communities been affected? For example, Beverly Hills defeated a highway project in 1975 that would have run through its center. However, residents of Boyle Heights, which is largely Hispanic, watched six freeways cut through its neighborhood over the years, including two massive interchanges less than two miles apart. Uh, Dr. Avila, since you spoke to the historical perspective, could you start? And I'd like to ask the other panelists as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. So, so when I look at a map of freeways in today's Los Angeles, um, it looks nothing like the master plan that was drafted by the uh, California Division of Highways in the late 1940s. Um, according to that master plan, no community in, in the Los Angeles urban re uh, region was to be more than four miles uh, from a freeway on-ramp. Um, but clearly that's not the case. And the freeways that exist today reflect roughly about one third of what that master plan was supposed to be because of many protests in different parts of the city. So for example, yes, Beverly Hills um, uh, organized in opposition to the construction of one freeway, what was, what was supposed to be called the Santa Monica Freeway, which was to run along Santa Monica Boulevard from well, uh, from like Glendale to Echo Park all the way to Santa Monica Bay. Um, but the people of Beverly Hills were not having it. They, they organized an opposition, they said no. Um, and with their connections in city government and their wealth and their clout, they successfully defeated that proposal. However, uh, there were also protests in Boyle Heights in the 1950s um, by racially and ethnically diverse working class people who protested the onslaught of six freeways and two massive interchanges. Um, and even though they protested in similar ways to the people of Beverly Hills, um, they lost that effort. And, and that's why the freeways converge upon Boyle Heights in the way that they do. So that right there to me is a signal of the kind of inequality, um, the racial and class inequality uh, that structured the freeway system that we know today in LA. Wonderful. Uh, so this one is for Dr. Laban very, very specifically. What about the Purple Line extension through Beverly Hills that successfully completed decking last summer for the subway station at Wilshire and Rodeo and it's seven months ahead of schedule? Yeah, um, it, it, that's an interesting uh, segment of, of our Purple Line. You know, um, Dr. Avila had um, mentioned about the protests, and you know, uh, you also had mentioned about the protests that um, were done by the, by the community uh, against the freeway system. And we had similar, you know, uh, concerns, you know, from the communities uh, um, over there in terms of building the uh, subway system as well. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is not necessarily about one community. This is all about, you know, connecting uh, the various communities here in Los Angeles, allowing, uh, our stakeholders, you know, and uh, to to go from uh, the Inland Empire uh, um, from from many parts of Los Angeles to uh, the West Side, for example, allowing folks from uh, South LA to access the beach, for example, you know, through our public transportation system. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to add as well, that you know, uh, the pandemic um, had uh, made us accelerate or helped us accelerate many of these projects, going back to your question, you know, uh, simply because there was no traffic, you know, uh, to, to go around uh, for, for the most part. Uh, and, and because of that, you know, and because of this acceleration of, uh, of many of our projects, uh, we're able to uh, deliver you know, uh, these projects ahead of time. Uh, a couple more points on going back to, to your question earlier in terms of the history uh, as well as the activism. You know, um, I just wanted to uh, share a story uh, when one time I actually sat down with uh, some of our American uh, Indian uh, uh, nation uh, tribes here uh, in Los Angeles. And they were showing me a map from back in the 1930s, which I, I didn't realize back then that it was actually a map from that point in time. Uh, but it uh, somehow showed, you know, the uh, assemblance of the freeway system, you know, uh, and they educated me on the fact that, you know, many of our freeways here in Los Angeles were actually built uh, on uh, trade routes uh, from uh, our Native American uh, uh, past. Um, <clears throat> and then that's one part of it. The other part of it, too, is that, you know, because of the activism of, of our stakeholders, you know, we're able to actually build, you know, this transportation system in the most sustainable and resilient way. You know, uh, we have set policies uh, here in, in the agency to uh, actually, for example, um, uh, use the cleanest, greenest pieces of equipment uh, in, uh, in building out, you know, a lot of our projects. So that reduces the amount of air quality issues associated with these projects. And then finally, you know, um, uh, while there is a, uh, an environmental uh, um, uh, law, uh, the California Environmental Quality Act that governs us uh, on, on how we should build these projects, you know, we make sure that we're proactive and allow, you know, uh, the community to have input, you know, not only on how the project looks like, but how we actually build those projects and operate those projects in the future. So activism has really played a part to complement um, what's been said already. Activism, communities, input, stakeholder, we're very conscious of those and we bring those into the forefront of the things that we do here in the agency. Great, thank you for that. And bringing it kind of home to us, uh, Dr. Liban, can you tell us how you think the LO, LA Metro is going to change the experience for the UCLA community when the Westwood UCLA Purple Line station opens? That's an interesting question. Uh, I, <laughs> I went there and I know how it is uh, first thing in the morning, you know, especially when you have uh, an eight o'clock exam, it's already 7.45 and you still need to look for parking, you know, at uh, uh, parking lot nine uh, <laughs> here somewhere else. But anyway, uh, uh, we're really all about, you know, sustainability, resiliency, equity, customer experience, you know, uh, those are the major, you know, components of, of um, what we're trying to do here in the organization. And you know, while there are two projects uh, that are uh, currently being uh, studied, you know, one along the 405 freeway that has an option uh, to UCLA, and the other one, you know, goes to the Santa Monica Mountains uh, uh, that has a uh, a segment into UCLA. You know, regardless of which one of those, uh, we have heard very loud and clear in the last few months that, you know, the option to go to campus over there is very essential. You know, it would change not only, you know, the, the travel time, obviously, of, of those uh, kids uh, and, and the employees of the university, but allowing, you know, folks who have not had the Westwood experience, experience Westwood, like what, how we opened up East LA when our system went to East LA. You know, uh, and I mean that in a good way, not, not necessarily uh, to, um, you know, gentrify those neighborhoods, but connect those neighborhoods to the rest of the city. Because we, for one, for, for, for all, for, for, for all, for what it's worth, you know, we're one Los Angeles and we need to be really working together uh, for the future of this city and county. Thank you, Dr. Levan. We are all excited about that station. So um, my next question is for Dr. Patterson. From a policy perspective, 
how can cities implement new transportation initi initiatives or adjust existing systems to avoid the inequity we've witnessed historically? Yeah, I really appreciate this question. And um, I would say through equitable process. And so really through the co-creation of new decision-making processes that really center community. And so for me, um, individually, personally, I'm a proponent of freeway removal. And so we've heard the history of freeway construction and your question around activism um, being effective in changing transportation laws. And you can look at this current moment that we're in now. We have the Economic Justice Act, which includes that was proposed and includes funding to reconnect communities. We have the American Jobs Plan, which uh, proposes 20 billion to reconnect communities divided by highway infrastructure. We have the Reconnecting Communities Act, which also outlines ways for doing that. And, it, and so though it was um, a lot of activism, particularly in communities of color was not successful at the time of construction, um, it's because of this organizing that we really are at this moment now, and we have success stories with the 880, we have success stories with several um, freeway teardown projects, um, and now we have this federal legislation. And so it's because of that community organizing, but as mentioned, I'm a proponent of things like freeway removals and free and accessible public transit, but it must really be tailored to the um, these interventions must really be tailored to the specific needs of local community based on meaningful community engagement. Um, and so I do uh, 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 want to touch upon the point earlier around community knowledge that we may not have been familiar with. And so for me, um, I come to this as an engineer, but I like to say that while I received my academic training in engineering, I came to truly understand the human consequences of transportation related policies and practices through the work, well, particularly the work of black women environmental justice organizers. They were the ones who have really told me and informed my research, my advocacy and what solutions can really look like. And so cities can implement new initiatives that are really led by community visions for reimagining our transportation systems. Wonderful, great. Could I, could I add Yes, to Professor point? Avila. Uh, I, I think Dr. Potterson is making just a really brilliant point. Um, and I, I would just add to it by, by also thinking about how we can listen to communities uh, that don't necessarily speak in traditional or formal ways. I mean, yes, there are formal uh, modes of activism that we're all familiar with, but there are also informal modes of activism. Um, I don't know if you can see the paintings behind me, um, the red and the orange. That's from a, a Mexican-American artist who grew up in Boyle Heights during the 1950s and 60s. And he was very active in the Mexican-American civil rights movement that was, um, really based in East LA and in Boyle Heights. And he was part of a generation of, of Chicano and Chicana activists who um, through their art and through their literature um, characterized the trauma that Boyle Heights experienced during the age of the freeway. Um, and there's a rich body of, of art, of muralism, of literature, of poetry uh, from Mexican American men and women um, who who took it upon themselves to document um, the environmental degradation that happened in their neighborhoods as a form of protest. Um, and yes, while we are trained as, as scientists, as engineers, as scholars, as researchers, um, there has to be room for us to be able to uh, listen to non-traditional modes of protest um, from the people who experienced uh, this kind of, of infrastructural trauma firsthand. Wonderful point. Thank you, Professor Avila. So this question is for all of our panelists. Um, LA is often stereotyped as a city where you absolutely need a car to navigate the landscape. How can we shift this perspective to promote alternate modes of transportation that may be more sustainable and environmentally friendly? I can start, you know, um, as a transportation slash sustainability environmental professional, you know, I, I live what I work in, right? You know, um, before the pandemic, um, I, I ride, you know, the bus uh, from where I live in Westchester, uh, have two connections, you know, to go to my work in downtown Los Angeles. 
And, you know, prior to that, you know, when my son was going to Loyola High School, you know, I would actually drop him off, you know, uh, um, riding the bus. Uh, and I had five connections when I was dropping him off, uh, you know, in, in Loyola High School. Uh, going back to the point, you know, uh, there is a perception that you actually need a, need a car. But, you know, you, we just need to be really looking more closely at our communities. There are people like myself and, and, and those who are taking the public transportation system that it's not, by, it's not because we can't afford a car, but because we chose to be in that state. And, you know, and, and I emphasize the choice because, you know, nowadays, you know, people have the technology at their fingertips to actually not just ride the bus or the train or drive the car, but, you know, in, in you have in our transit app, you know, you can go multimodal, you know, we have, we have the scooters there, we have the bike share in there, we have the car share in there, we have the you know, if you want to drive occasionally, you can park your car in one of our uh, uh, park and ride stations and ride the bus uh, or the train to wherever you need to go. It's really just up to us. It's an option, right? Uh, and, and I think at the end of the day, you know, um, it's not necessarily, you know, the perception that one needs to drive the car to go around. And I've seen this firsthand, you know, it's the perception that the public transportation system is only for people who cannot afford a car. And so therefore, you know, people who like me, who ride the bus and train in a suit, you know, maybe it's just, you know, playing uh, uh, as if, you know, I'm anyone else, but I can't afford a car. No, I can't, but it's my choice to go that route. And I think that's the fundamental message that needs to go out there. It's our choice to try the system. It's our choice to make the system work. For us, it's our choice to make sure that the system actually functions according to what we want it to function for. Great, thank you for making that point. Uh, this question is for everyone and perhaps Dr. Patterson, you would like to speak to it. Are there any other barriers to advancing more sustainable transportation options? Yes, so something that I was going to add and then can, uh, carry into this question as well is it's the putting onus on transportation planners in design and so we're fortunate to have someone who works in public transportation and so it's great to hear that perspective and I think also we do also need to recognize that there is this continued emphasis on um, through design automobile dominated transportation systems like we got in a Los Angeles because of um, transportation design that prioritizes cars and roadways. And so we designed the current state of the transportation system. And so now we need to have, through reimagining, we need a new design uh, paradigm and shift to create a new transportation system. And so for some, it is a choice to be able to ride public transit. For some, they are transit dependent. And for some, due to circumstances, they, um, our, our, and design of our communities, we are car dependent. Um, and so it, it is going to require um, a new paradigm in transportation and infrastructure planning. A barrier though is our funding and investments. Um, so since the 1980s, we have this um, kind of practice of the 80-20 rule with federal legislation where 80% of funding goes to roadways, 20% goes to public transit. And even though you have new legislation like the American Jobs Plan that has a huge amount for public transit um, and, and increases the proportion, you still continue to get this prioritization of roadways and cars. So even when we talk about climate change and climate related policies, there's all this emphasis for electric vehicles. But for me, it's we need to get away from vehicles. Um, and as someone who focuses on um, particularly black community, electric vehicles continue to rely on infrastructures of harm or freeways. And so how do we have a completely new transportation design? And that is going to start with funding mechanisms, as well as the prioritization of our transportation planners, our transportation engineers. And so I put the onus on them as well. The onus has been put where it belongs. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Um, I have a question for, uh, for Dr. Laban very specifically. We know that a majority of transit riders are women. 
Can you elaborate on LA Metro's gender action plan or GAP? Yeah, I mean, it all started with, um, you know, the study that we had, you know, how women travel, you know, from a few years ago. And um, essentially, you know, um, there's a couple of things in there. One is um, there's a, the user experience. You know, a uh, um, significant amount of our riders are, are women. Uh, I believe it's more than uh, half uh, on certain times of the day. Uh, and, um, you know, um, please don't get me wrong with the statement. You know, a lot of uh, our women riders, you know, have to carry more than people like myself, men. You know, uh, uh, they have, they, sometimes they're towing children, you know, with them. Sometimes they're, they have cars. Sometimes, you know, they're the ones who are making the, gro uh, doing the groceries for the family and whatnot. So allowing us to, to actually, you know, uh, um, redesign not only the service, uh, but also the, the system to, to actually uh, allow uh, a more uh, and a better uh, use experience for, for our women riders uh, is, is that part of it. Uh, the, the other uh, component uh, of, of the conversation is, you know, security and safety. You know, um, 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 a significant number of, of our riders, again, uh, are, are, are women and, and, and often, you know, they're, they're by themselves. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of uh, some initiatives that we have put out there, you know, we have, uh, for example, examined our bus stops, you know, uh, where uh, lighting is missing, you know, where uh, getting funding to include and increase the number of lighting uh, at those bus stops, uh, as well as rail stops, uh, where those bus stops are connecting to, uh, and then um, uh, ensuring, you know, that, uh, you know, um, women who travel the system feel safe, uh, they are able to go where they need to go, uh, and at the same time, you know, um, maintain the uh, user experience that we expect you know, uh, to, uh, to, to have uh, for, for our customers there. Uh, and one final point I just wanted to make in here that, you know, we have also have a women and girls council, you know, here in the agency. Uh, and that's really a collective of women from different departments in the organization. Uh, and I work very closely with the women and girl, girls council uh, in, in working with them, uh, not only in, in, uh, in our space here, but because sustainability and resiliency, which is the focus and onus of, of what I am working in within LA Metro, you know, um, we, we also work together with them, you know, on, on many aspects that I already mentioned. Uh, so there are sounding board uh, for many of these ideas uh, and we are uh, the execution arm or one of the execution arms of the ideas that they receive. Uh, from other stakeholders, uh, not only within, but also outside of the organization. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this question is for Dr. Patterson, who is soon to become Professor Patterson. So you will see this fits in very well. How can higher education institutions better prepare their students to work in the transportation field thoughtfully and reasonably and responsibly. I think you talked about how you were trained as a chemical engineer and what the output, your input streams and your output and that this idea of equity and, and that was not brought to the forefront. So what can we do as educators to really help our students understand that it is their responsibility, this whole issue of transportation and equity? Yeah, so Dr. Poulonial is referencing a lecture. I had the pleasure of giving a guest lecture in the Engineering in Action course, though. Um, yeah, so really talking about the need to recognize that technical problems are inherently social and political. Um, so often in conventional engineering courses, as Dr. Paul O'Neill mentioned, um, we're taught to look at just the, the technical problems. So evaluating input streams as an example, um, again, in chemical engineering, looking at uh, oil processes. But we really need to teach students to look at transportation and really all engineering fields through an intersectional lens from pop, um, problem identification to solutions. And I really um, liked Professor Avila's mention of recognizing non-traditional forms of protest and activism. And so when translating that into what does that mean for um, higher institutions and in learning, recognizing non-traditional forms of knowledge, um, particularly citations, 
so often we are told the only things that are worth citing are things that you can look up on the catalog, like the UCLA catalog, public library catalog, but so much knowledge, um, as Dr. Laban talked about, um, and speaking with indigenous groups comes from these non-traditional forms of knowledge. And so making sure that students recognize that these forms of knowledge are just as valuable and just as valid as the textbook um, and making sure that we expand both our understanding of what these problems are, again, through this intersectional lens, how to frame them, and what forms of knowledge we can use to answer and solve these problems, as well as making sure that the expertise is not just in the engineering classroom, but the expertise is also with communities. So reevaluating what that partnership between high, um, institutions and local community UCLA is a public institution, so there is a responsibility, in my opinion, to make sure that our learning and our research directly benefits um, public, the public, and so particularly being in Los Angeles, making sure that it benefits Los Angeles residents. Um, and so UCLA already has this commitment through like the Awareness to Action, the Engineering in Action course. Um, UC Berkeley had an, an American cultures requirement. So be being very um, intentional and deliberate in elective requirements for students. Um, I think students should be required to take courses in gender, in race, um, and to understand how that directly connects to their engineering. It's not, oh, this is separate, this is cool, this is interesting. No, everything that you learn there is directly applicable to everything that you're doing in engineering. And so making sure that students start to have um, these interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary understandings of technical problems. I think that's an excellent point. And I, I... I would, I would add that I think we need to do some soul searching, um, especially in engineering and planning um, about what constitutes knowledge and expertise um, and data. You know, is the painting behind me a form of data? Um, I think it is because it was created by someone who firsthand experienced um, the trauma and violence that was uh, racked upon Boyle Heights in the age of the freeway. Um, and, you know, thinking about my own work on, on the role of science in the 1950s um, from transportation agencies, um, you know, the, the white men who, who were uh, staffing these agencies um, were very, very technical in their data accumulation and their belief in, in their scientific expertise was unquestioned. Um, and that was true of, you know, American cultural attitudes towards science in, in the 1950s to begin with. The science that brought us nuclear weapons, for example. Um, the science that brought us freeways and other forms of, of technology, allegedly for the benefit of so-called mankind. Um, you know, that was a very specific form of, of knowledge and data. Um, that I think was gendered as objective, right? Those two things are, you know, are, are um, have a long history together in our value system of, of um, you know, thinking about uh, data and science as something masculine and objective. Um, and, and I think now we're, we're way beyond that point. You know, the, the, the academy in general has undergone a, a revolution in the way that we think about what constitutes knowledge and science and how science has been you know, beneficial, but also incredibly destructive as well. Um, so I think there's a, a larger issue here that, that um, we need to get a handle on. One of the things I do with my students, um, I take them to Boyle Heights and, and we walk around Boyle Heights. And every time we go, my students are absolutely astounded by just how bewildering this environment is. I mean, anywhere you go in Boyle Heights, you're either in the shadow of a freeway, you're above a freeway, uh, you're, you're facing the concrete walls that abut freeways. Um, it's a highly disorienting environment. And that kind of personal experience, um, I think is essential to um, re-envisioning transportation policy going forward. Yep. And if I can add uh, to uh, what Dr. Patterson and Dr. Avila had mentioned there, you know, um, I originally was not a uh, in the transportation industry. You know, I, I um, uh, graduated with a science degree. You know, uh, then went on to 
uh, civil engineering, uh, and then went on to uh, study a in, in an interdisciplinary program, you know, over there at UCLA uh, through the environmental science and engineering program. Ran, you know, because I've uh, done most of um, my technical courses. You know, my focus really during that uh, program was uh, uh, learning more about how policy is made, you know, and how uh, policy actually impacts, you know, the lives of people, uh, obviously using, you know, my technical skills as, as um, uh, Dr. Avila there has, um, has described for, for people like myself. But what I just wanted to add, you know, uh, given the backdrop is the fact that, you know, uh, a significant amount of of my learning of the transportation system, the transportation inequities, and the things I've talked about in the past, uh, you know, 20 or so minutes is really experiential. You know, uh, it's the things that, you know, I hear about when I'm sitting with the bus riders, you know, it's the things I hear about when I'm standing, you know, on the corner of uh, Expo and Western, you know, uh, as I, uh, come out of the expo line uh, and, you know, stand there uh, with uh, the other bus riders uh, on the 102 uh, to wait for the 102. Um, and, you know, the experiences that I also learned uh, from our stakeholders, you know, when I to understand from them and with them, you know, why certain things uh, that we do here in, in LA Metro, you know, uh, mean, you know, either positively or negatively you know, uh, for, for us to advance, you know, uh, you know, those, those ideas uh, and, and, and projects that we, we do here. So um, the other part of that too, uh, which uh, last one I want to make in here in this experiential uh, uh, element that I'm talking about is that, you know, I'm consciously trying to invest, you know, uh, in, in terms of training in our communities, you know, uh, we have training programs here in the agency we're in, you know, we actually invite, you know, other people uh, to not only sit down with us, you know, learn more about the agency, uh, but learn more as well uh, of, of our vision here in the organization. You know, uh, this is truly uh, collaborative work. And in order for us to build more of the economic, what we consider, uh, hopefully not sounding too biased, the economic and social backbone of Los Angeles, which is this transportation system. In, in order to build this in the most effective way, we need to bring all those voices together with us, understanding them and them understanding us, you know, as we move forward uh, in, in building these. So. Uh, absolutely, Dr. Laban, and thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, all engineers and computer scientists have a responsibility to society. I mean, if you take the oath of the engineer as a senior and you get put that ring on, that's the thing you're agreeing to do. What I don't think is always clear to engineers and computer scientists is how you do that, right? Because we don't have a lot of collaborative, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary actions. We take our, our strict engineering and computing classes, and so we don't see what that looks like, but it, it does require collaboration in order to make that happen. So um, I'd like to ask Professor Avila, what does community engagement look like around these issues of, of equity and justice and not just in transportation, but engineers and computer scientists generally? What does that community, community engagement look like? I mean, I think we've been talking about these issues, but, but to me, it, you know, it, it really comes down to an ability to listen to people. Um, Scientists in general, engineers, architects are not known for their ability to listen, to hear communities. And I think we've, we've talked about the different ways that we can listen. Um, but, you know, it, after the thrust of highway construction in the 50s and 60s, uh, especially with the oil crisis in 1973, um, you know, the United States kind of scaled back its ambitions to build highways in every city and, and all across the United States. And, and there were some real reforms that were done in terms of community input into um, the design and construction and especially the routing of freeways. So that I think was a first step um, in, in mandating community input, community engagement and making sure um, that, that there was a space for communities to, to talk back 
um, to, to planners and engineers and city officials about their work. I think we need to take that further. Um, but, but for me, it, it comes down to an ability to listen to communities and to understand their needs, their perspectives, their histories, um, and, and their, um, their ambitions for their communities. Absolutely. And I'd like to briefly just add um, to the listening and just clarifying or specifying listening before coming with ideas. So often we, we propose things, we have your solution, um, but making sure that the listening is before there is even the solution um, thought process. And so that's why when I mentioned earlier problem identification, even that is um, that also requires listening because how we define problems, the questions that are being asked, um, as Professor Avili mentioned, um, things are gendered. We say that all of our questions are these objective questions, but everything about your experience frames the questions that we are asking, particularly in our research, the way in which these things are being framed. I might ask, I might look at the same thing someone else is looking at, but have a completely different question. And so even from the problem identification, we need to be listening to how the community defines the problem before we can even begin this process. And so just making sure that the listening it's, it's just understood that the listing begins at the very beginning um, and not in, hey, we have something for you. What do you think? Of, and so just wanted to clarify <laughs> that part. Yes, yes, Dr. Patterson. The listing be starts at the beginning, goes through the implementation. When it's over, how did we do? And how do we feed back and make it better? So the listening um, is a complete loop and an entire process. Um, yep. I'd like to ask, um, oh, Dr. LeBron, did you want to? No, I just wanted to say, I can't, can't agree with Dr. Patterson anymore, you know, and uh, I, I don't know, Dr. Patterson, when do you start at UCLA? I'd like to talk to you uh, offline. Uh, and Dr. Avila, you know, this has been uh, a great conversation here. And for me personally, you know, uh, I have been bringing in a significant amount of, uh, of, of these tracks, if you may, uh, that we've, we've talked about here, you know, uh, in, into the practice not only of civil engineering, but the practice of civil engineering uh, in transportation, right? So um, uh, the UCLA Grand Challenge, uh, we're trying to work something out with them and, and training, you know, some of the um, uh, the students from 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 that uh, from from that initiative. Uh, we have our own uh, initiatives here uh, that you know complement many of the things that we talked about. So uh, I'm hoping. It's an outcome, you know, of, of our conversation today here. It's not just, you know, a recorded video, but really for us to be working together so that, you know, some of these issues, systemic issues that we've talked about here could actually be resolved. Wonderful. A real collaboration was made here, folks. You heard it. So, and it's recorded. So it's going to be an official thing. So thank you for that. This question is for each of you, and I would like to start with Professor Avila. What is your vision for transportation infrastructure for large cities like Los Angeles? That's a huge question. Um, uh, I, I just off the top of my head, um, you know, I, I, I think it should be um, multimodal. Um, I think it should be equitable. Um, I think it should be, you know, environmentally just. Um, and I think coming back to, to, to your very first question, Dr. Poole O'Neill, about um, what does transportation equity mean? It's equal access uh, to the city from, from all parts of the city. Um, that's, that's what I would like to see, um, one in which you know, drivers and bus riders and metro riders have an equal voice, an equal stake in, in the development of, and pedestrians have a, have a, a stake um, in, in the transportation development of the city going forward. Great, Dr. Patterson? Yeah, so um, again, completely agree, multimodal, um, accessible, reliable, climate just, and, um, Two things I'll, I'll add. At the beginning, I said affordable and safe. And so in terms of public transit, I will specify free and police free. 
And so um, I will say in terms of safety, um, particularly for the black community, it's an issue of racial equity. Um, and so ensuring that we have unarmed response in public transit, both because of um, inequitable fare enforcement, as well as uh, just racial violence in policing. And so I would say free, accessible, reliable police for public transit and multimodal streets. Dr. LeBon. Yeah, I just apologize for the, the sign in the background. Um, uh, I have good news for Dr. Avila and Dr. Patterson. Uh, we're actually either doing that already or some form of the vision that you've described. Uh, and um, I uh, point out to the most progressive board we've ever had here in LA Metro in bringing that vision uh, to us here in the agency. You know, our CEO, Phil Washington, you know, one of the most progressive CEOs have gone through four uh, or uh, three already. Uh, and uh, Mr. Washington has been uh, one of the most progressive, not necessarily just here in Los Angeles, but you know, across the entire uh, transit agency, transit industry. Uh, so we're moving towards those, um, uh, that vision. Uh, one thing I just wanted to, to add there, you know, because this is my space, is you know, really a sustainable and climate resilient, you know, transportation system. And you know, um, uh, that may sound too technical, right? And that might sound like very fine and and and, and very narrow. But you know, uh, within that framework uh, is the you know this whole idea of a uh, social sustainability that has an equity component to it, right? Uh, and we have that initiative as well here in the organization um, through the American Public Transportation Association, we've also developed some metrics, you know, on how uh, to measure, you know, the, the social impacts of, of transportation, uh, as well as the, the benefits, you know, that we derive, uh, not only from transportation, but the land use co-benefits of transportation itself. You know, uh, we don't have time, obviously, to talk about those details, but, you know, uh, there's a lot more to LA Metro than what everybody sees in buses and trains. Underlying, you know, uh, that that system are progressive thinkers, uh, people who really care about the community. And going back to the point earlier, we listen, and specifically through my lens, we listen to anyone and everyone who cares to talk to us. And I listen to, and I speak, to anyone who ever cares to listen to us. So, Great. Thank you, Dr. Levon. Now we're going to transition to some questions from our audience members who are just chomping at the bit. And this first question, um, I'll address it to Dr. Patterson, but anyone could feel free to also add. How can zoning and land use policy be changed to allow for more sustainable transportation? Great question. Um, I, th I think for my response, um, I'll speak to the need for intersectional policies. And so when we talk about transportation, we should also be talking about housing, specifically affordable housing. Um, when we talk about transportation, we should be talking about um, communities designed to um, access all goods and services um, easily and in short distances. Um, and so zoning changes really need to look at making sure we do not have this separation between residential and um, places of work um, and, and school. And so just the, the single use zoning that has resulted or contributed to sprawl and contributed to these automobile dominated transportation systems. And so changing zoning so that we can have um, community densification, but also doing so in a way that enables longtime residents to remain through affordable housing um, and these intersectional policies that really center equity in doing so. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. I wanna to get to one more question from the audience for sure. Um, the question is, is it possible to change the layout of Los Angeles to a people instead of car oriented city? Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Patterson just kind of hit that point in her last remark. Um, I think density is, is a key. Um, building up instead of out, um, forsaking the 
uh, suburban home with a white picket fence and the two car garage. I think we need to let go of that as a relic uh, of the past um, and, and begin to embrace density, to learn to love our neighbors enough to want to live above them and below them and, and, and to be open to alternatives to um, the single family home that has dominated the history of land use in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, I wanted to add to, to that as well. You know, um, prior to the pandemic, uh, there has been significant push uh, to, to actually build uh, above and around uh, the LA metro stations. Um, and, you know, these have been traditionally called transit oriented developments that, you know, we have renamed as transit oriented communities for a number of different reasons you know, that I won't go into in here. Um, there were specific assumptions on densification uh, around uh, those stations and, and in communities, and rightfully so. You know, um, uh, transit, uh, public transit in particular, um, uh, provides um, the more people use it, you know, uh, the more we reduce vehicle miles traveled, uh, you know, uh, in, in solo driving, uh, the more we, uh, we promote the reduction of congestion. But at the same time, you know, uh, the, the, through these projects that we were working with, you know, in transit-oriented developments and transit-oriented communities, you know, uh, there's the land use co-benefit, you know, uh, wherein we, uh, there's a promotion of walking and cycling and scootering, if that's the word, you know, around neighborhoods. Um, for better or worse, uh, the pandemic had really turned a lot of these significant assumptions on, on densification over above it, its head. And uh, for the most part, and this is just a personal view, I'm not an academic, but you know, I'm speaking here as, as a person who just reads a lot and observes a lot, that you know, uh, for the most part, uh, in, in urban centers and specifically around our stations, you know, um, uh, folks have become, become have began to to flee into bigger spaces, you know, as telecommuting and teleworking, you know, had become uh, more common, you know, uh, because of the pandemic. I'm not saying that's be that's going to become the norm, you know, forever, uh, but at the same time, you know, um, us here in in LA Metro, you know, in my group in particular, you know, as we work through our uh, climate solutions, the strategies that we work with our stakeholders in the communities, you know, we are revisiting the assumptions that were there prior to the pandemic and considering, you know, with a very open mind, you know, what could be some of the iterations and possibilities and, and how the transportation could eventually look like, you know, in the future. Uh, we just released our long range transportation plan, you know, uh, about a year, about uh, eight months ago. Uh, the long range transportation plan uh, is still considered, you know, and this is a matter of public record, you know, still considered the assumptions pre pandemic. But through the short range transportation plan, some of the issues I've, I mentioned here uh, in, in terms of rethinking and, and, and maybe, you know, redesigning, you know, uh, how our transportation looks like, transportation system looks like. Uh, that that could be that will be part of our short range transportation planning process. Great. So I have a question for all of the panelists, and it's really just a, a plea and a request. Would you mind if we extend this by ten minutes? Uh, we've we've run out of time, but there are still a lot of questions from the audience that we want to try to get a few more in. So could you stick around for another ten minutes with us? Yeah, Gustavo has been uh, texting me, but I'm on my phone, so I'm, I'm okay. okay. <laughs> I don't want to okay. lose you. <laughs> okay, 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 great, great, great. I'm glad everybody's still here. Um, yeah. So here's, here's another question that we have. Uh, uh, an audience member said, I didn't hear much mention of bicycling in the discussion, yet it offers sustainability, flexibility, environmental stewardship, equity, all mentioned by the speakers. How can we get bicycling to the table? I, I can start, you know, uh, we have a bike share program, you know, that's part of, you know, uh, what, what Dr. Alvila and, and, and Dr. Patterson mentioned earlier as well uh, in, in terms of a uh, multimodal vision, right? So uh, we, we have bicycling as part of that network. Uh, you know, we have a bike share program 
you know, we also offer incentives uh, to our employees, you know, to, to actually, you know, uh, do uh, um, bike to work. Um, you know, we have in our planning process, you know, creating more bike paths, you know, not only uh, as a parallel project, you know, to our uh, rail projects, uh, but, you know, uh, we're working together with uh, stakeholders on envisioning the LA River, for example, uh, and, and allowing us to, to use, you know, the LA River, uh, not only for, you know, its fundamental use, uh, uh, for better or worse, as a storm, uh, you know, conveyance, stormwater conveyance to the ocean, but, you know, for recreational purposes that includes, you know, uh, uh, biking uh, uh, to wherever our folks need to go. Uh, and, and that, that biking program to complement, you know, the, the rest of the public transportation system. And, and last but not the least, you know, um, uh, like what I said earlier, you know, um, we're, we're open to any other ideas out there. You know, uh, this, there is a significant amount of innovation, you know, within, within LA Metro. You know, I'll just speak for my department. Uh, what we're not good at, we're good at a lot of things, but what we're not good at is really telling the general public, and I'm just speaking for my department, the general public on on what is out there, what we've been working on, and what the vision is. Uh, but like what I said earlier, you know, I would speak to anyone who cares to listen, and I would listen to anyone who cares to speak to us. So, uh, but there. One thing that I'd like to add to um, biking is the need to have bikeable infrastructure. Um, studies have shown that there are less street infrastructure investments in low income communities of color, particularly black communities. And so if we want to increase biking, even though there is prevalence of biking, but if we want to increase biking as a real option for um, going between work and home, errands and home, there is a need to ensure that there are equitable investments so that um, biking is an option from a, a perspective of safety, as well as a perspective of distance. And so again, getting back to that zoning question, is biking always an option if you work 30 miles away from work? I'm not biking 30 miles to work. <laughs> Um, and so just really thinking about how our cities are designed to ensure biking as an actual commuting option um, and to ensure that the street infrastructure um, supports biking in terms of safety. I would just add, I, I think there's maybe a global dimension to this as well that, that we might want to think about. You know, I lived in, in Holland for um, a year and everyone is on bicycles. I mean, it, it their cities are completely adapted to, to bicycling. Um, and I think we can learn from um, other cities, uh, other programs in other cities. Same thing to come back to the issue of gender and, and the policy of many cities to restrict certain cars for women um, on subways or on trains in other parts of the world. So, you know, it's happening um, elsewhere. We do have, um, programs like Ciclavia here in LA that, that present a model um, for uh, greater opportunities for, for bicycling and creating a more bike friendly city. So that's another program that I think we could learn from. Yep. Great, thank you. Just to emphasize the, a, a point there, you know, uh, Dr. Patterson, Dr. Avila, you know, um, we, we, there is a uh, bike path master plan, you know, uh, that uh, um, we, we have developed here in, in the organization. And, you know, um, um, that master plan, you know, uh, needs to be implemented. Uh, and, and for the most part, you know, uh, because of uh, the heightened awareness in many of the issues that we've talked about here, um, you know, um, that master plan, while recent, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, is, is, or is getting updated right now, uh, you know, needs to include, you know, some of these uh, heightened awareness of the issues uh, that may likely, and I'm just, you know, saying this is an opinion, may likely might not have been part of the conversation when when that was, was put together. So um, uh, that's being worked on uh, and um, uh, we're, we're happy to, to hear uh, from uh, 
from you uh, uh, and anyone uh, who else uh, uh, who would uh, provide input uh, at some point uh, when we op we open that up again. So, and I do just want to quickly add. Um, bringing this back to my earlier point around policing and, and transportation. And so ha the fact that this conversation is happening around LA, um, I do want to call attention to Dijon Kizzi, who was killed riding a bicycle in LA. And so it is very important, particularly when we talk um, um, from a racial equity lens, that we talk about policing and as a deterrent to transportation modes um, for freedom of movement for black communities specifically and other communities of color. And so I think yeah. there's something that um, real that there's a conversation that needs to be elevated within transportation and transportation equity around policing in this academic and practitioner um, um, conversation. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. That is a, a good point and well to be made. And it goes back to your point of listening before. So Dr. Laban said, you know, there's this thing, but we didn't consider those issues. So that the fact that they're willing to listen now, and then they'll be listening throughout. And again, we have the continuous feedback loop to make it better. It's wonderful. This will probably be our last question. Uh, so it's for anyone who wants to answer. Are there existing or emerging technology options that can reasonably replace the existing car freeway system that meet the demand as well as the convenience? And if there are, um, what, what are they? Yeah, th that's an interesting question because, um, you know, for example, one of the projects that we're, we're trying to build right now uh, is a gondola between Union Station and Dodger Stadium. So that's gone through a <laughs> it's gone through a planning process or going through a planning process, and you know it's gone through in front of our board. And you know, for the most part, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, uh, not too obvious, uh, but uh, a reality. You know, uh, uh, there's a lot of innovation happening in in Los Angeles Metro, right? Uh, and you know, um, there's also conversation about automated vehicles. You know, we have uh, uh, been looking at micro mobility systems. You know, uh, we have pilots going on uh, along those lines in some areas, including my neighborhood in Westchester, uh, wherein, you know, there's uh, not necessarily a fixed route, uh, but, you know, you call it and then, uh, you know, uh, given a crowdsourced, um, you know, route, you know, people get. Uh, uh, transported from one location to another at a very reasonable fare. Uh, we're also experimenting on, you know, um, a um, uh, not necessarily related to automated systems, but you know, or, or new forms of transportation, but a fareless system initiative. You know, uh, we're in, we're working uh, uh, initially with students. Uh, um, this pilot will be launching uh, this coming fall. And understanding really what is the impact of of a fearless initiative uh, in the traffic patterns that might emerge, you know, uh, as we go back, you know, post pandemic into our workplaces, you know, and at the same time allowing, you know, uh, um, more access and so therefore, uh, hopefully higher volume of transit riders, you know, in, in our system. So just some examples of the, the things that are out there. Uh, and, you know, um, oh, actually one last example, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, work through uh, and weave through, you know, uh, a seamless way to navigate the different multimodal modes of transportation, right? Uh, we started this before with a regional rail system, Metrolink into Metro, you know, now there's an ability to, to actually work through you know, uh, the, um, uh, and th this forthcoming, you know, I don't want to speak for, for that group, but, um, you know, uh, a seamless way to do uh, bike share uh, and then bus and rail uh, and, and maybe Metrolink in the future. It's really um, a, a good challenge to have. And, you know, the, the great people who are working on this are here in Los Angeles and, you know, uh, the product will be coming out soon. Uh, so. I think it's important to acknowledge, though, I, I don't have a pat answer to that question. That's a really tough question. But yeah. I do think it's important to acknowledge that the car and the freeway are the product of a specific moment in history, 
a specific model of urbanization and land use, a specific moment in the history of technology, and also a specific set of values uh, about privacy, about home ownership, that doesn't have to uh, be with us forever. And I think as, as LA adapts to new forms of technology, new values, new patterns of land use, um, I don't think that the car and the automobile has to be the dominant mode of transportation the way it is now, but we have to rethink our values about what kind of city we want to live in um, and what kind of form we would like to see it take shape. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing your insightful comments. I've certainly learned a great deal from this conversation. As a born and raised in Michigan and being a product of the auto industry and maybe designing a car or two, I am now a reformed person. So thank you for this. Um, after hearing from our panelists, I hope everyone is excited and optimistic as I am um, about how we're gonna work together to really advance equitable transportation and sustainable transportation here in Los Angeles and throughout the world. This collaborative team is really gonna change the world, I'm convinced. Um, I once again wanna say thank you to our wonderful panelists, as well as our cross-campus collaborators and everyone who contributed to this event. Uh, please be on the lookout for more to come from the Engineering in Action series. Until we meet again, stay safe, be well, and go Bruins. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.